I'm Lee Baker, and welcome to this week's episode of Level Up the League. Boy, we're going to have some fun today. I am so excited to have one of my favorite people on with us today. She's a certified financial planner. She's an author. She's an industry leader. She's a speaker. She's a wife, and she's the mother of a bona fide girl boss. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce you to the amazing Lizetta Rainey Braxton. Lizetta, welcome to Level Up with Lee. Wow, Lee, I had no idea that I was one of your favorites. Oh, I'm so excited to top it up with you today. Absolutely. I know you. We've known each other for a while. But will you tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Well, I like to say that my way in the world is helping people transform human capital into equitable social and financial capital. I know that's a lot. So let me break it down for you. I believe that you, me, all of us are assets and that we should receive economic benefit for our contributions to the table. So that shows up for me in financial planning and coaching and speaking, all the things that you've said. I want to make sure that there's access to wealth. Wow. Okay. That that is a lot. That's a lot. That's a lot. So, you know, you and I, Money is kind of our everyday language, so to speak. That's 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 what we live and breathe and sort of swim in uh, from one day to the next. But let, let's spend a little time today talking about money conversations, if you will. Right? Um, everybody has conversations, whether words are formed or not. But when we're having conversations about money, what are some of the challenges that you see around having conversations about? It's funny that you said that what I said was a lot, because actually most people, when they're talking about money, they they say that that's a lot. So they probably would rather (laughs) ask questions about what I do instead of talking about money, which is the issue, right? Money is still a taboo topic. And thank goodness our clients come to us because they're ready to talk about money. Now, the fact that they're ready to talk about money doesn't necessarily mean mean that they're 100 percent ready to talk about money. They've taken that first step, which is to say, I need help. I want partnership. Can you help me make the most of what I have? And that includes knowing where my money is going. Gotcha. Gotcha. So when you're working with clients and in your experience, both from a professional and perhaps personal perspective, do you see any differences in how these conversations play out from one generation to the next when you, you think of, uh, you know, perhaps seasoned saints like ourselves who might be having conversations? You say ourselves. You're the seasoned saint. I'm, oh, okay. I'm definitely uh, a saint. A seasoned <laughs> saint like myself or a youngster like you. Right. <laughs> How do we have some of these conversations? You know, if if we're talking to somebody uh, who might be a parent, or again, if we're talking to our sons and daughters, when you're talking to some uh, clients that, that might be, uh, you know, let's call it the peer group above where our children are, do you see differences in how those conversations play out? All right. So jokes aside, I'm a Gen Xer, proud to be a Gen Xer. I have made it to the 50 and Fabulous Club. And what that means is that we're sandwich generation, right? So we have two mm-hmm. generations ahead of us. We have the silent generation and the baby boomers. My parents um, are young parents. We're young parents. So they are in the baby boomer generation. And then behind us, we have three. There are the millennials, the Gen um, Zers, that's where my daughter is. And I believe your two daughters are in that category as well. And then you have Gen Alpha, right? So that's a lot of conversations to be had across generations. In fact, my grandmother, my mom's mom is still living, thank goodness. And so that makes it for us four generations of possible conversations about wealth, how it was obtained, lost, rebuilt, the strategy to continue it on. Now, you asked about difference in in conversations. I will definitely say that I've observed that from the Salon generation, that's my grandmother, not a whole lot of conversations because there wasn't a whole lot of money. There was not much to talk about. She was a part of sharecroppers for both set of grandparents. So in essence, their change of um, currency really was housing (laughs) and food. There just wasn't a lot of money. Uh, my parents also, part of the segregation uh, era, were also raised as sharecroppers. And then they finally um, were able to secure employment that was really 
meaningful in addition to sharecropping as well. So when you talk about wealth for them, it was trying to obtain land um, and having enough money to live off on, not really enough money to, to transfer. Fast forward to Gen X, I mean, for us, you know, we were able to have more opportunities job wise, still had the, the the gaps in income for our counterparts, which we're also still seeing for the generations behind us that are in the workforce. When you have this gap in income, that means that there's also probably a gap in, in, in accumulating of wealth as well, too. So if I bring all this together, the key is, is to honor what each generation had to face give room to say we did the best we could with what we had. And even sometimes it might not have been the best decisions, but stress and oppression a lot will impact, right? How you go about managing your life and your, your resources. The key is, is to get together and have those conversations and treat family as a business. Okay. I, I like that. So I, I've got a question in my head and, and I think you may have just, Teed this up. So, are, are there some practical examples that you might be able to share with our viewers on how to have these critically important conversations? And these might be conversations that occur before uh, anybody ever says, "Yeah, you know what? I'm ready to to call Lee, or I'm ready to call Lizette, or some other certified financial planner, and have this discussion and take things to the next level." You know, when we're around the table at Thanksgiving or maybe after dinner before everybody's gone to sleep or started watching a football game, are there some practical examples of how people can tee up these conversations to treat those conversations like a business? You've identified times where family are together. You know, the Thanksgiving, Christmas gets a little sketchy because by then all the money is spent and nobody wants to talk about money. And Thanksgiving could be a little sketchy, too, the way that... <laughs> Exactly. So maybe when the sun is out, maybe, uh, you know, Memorial Day weekend or Labor Day weekend or Fourth of July weekend, right? When the energy is high, there's not a lot of spending in those particular seasons and just overall just good energy, right? Because it's the summertime and, and people are feeling right. great because you want to have conversations when people are feeling good. And sometimes Thanksgiving and Christmas is also a time of grief. Um, unfortunately, there are a lot of deaths that seem like they happen around the holidays time. So right. one, I would just say, be very mindful of the energy and cadence of your family, first of all, because it's a sensitive right. topic. You want the right conditions. Next, I would say one of the conversations that some people think is the most difficult to have, but I also see it as an entree for a conversation is, and I'm going to say it, it's talking about estate planning to get to the, to the numbers. And sure. what I mean by that is nobody wants to think about death or not being an able body, you know, or thinking about a, a, a time and place where you cannot act on your own, right? right? That's right. incapacity. What I have found, even with my parents and grandparents, is like, you know, this is a hard conversation. See you living forever, but what if something happens to you? Where do we go? Where do we find your bank information? Where do we find, right? So it's not asking specifically what you have. It's kind of getting the conversation to say, here with you, this is a part of the normal process. Let's just talk about what you have. What are your wishes? And then what you have. Right. And you may have to have that conversation five, six years in a row <laughs> to get some movement. The, the, the key is get started, have it, and then have folks. I can say, well, you know, Cars, she's now 18. She's an adult. It's important that she knows this and, and give an example of things that you are doing as well to balance out what you're asking somebody else to do. You know, you know how they say practice what you preach. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I'll be candid in, in sharing, if you will. I've got to do some practicing on my own. We had an experience uh, literally just two weeks ago. One of my uh, my oldest sister uh, wanted to come visit and uh, she's in the early stages of dementia. And so my brother bought her up and you know, we went through some of those dynamics of uh, her fully recognizing me coming up and 
quite honestly, having forgotten that the reason for the trip was because she wanted to come see me. And our daughters are away in college. And so we were letting them know, hey, your aunt's here, so on and so forth. Um, but what I discovered is in an off conversation, our younger daughter, who's 19, had communicated with our older daughter and, you know, wondered about, hey, what about when daddy gets that old? Right. And, and how do we handle some of those things? And so, you know, we had a, a brief conversation, but, you know, when uh, we go pick her up for break, we'll have a more in-depth conversation sometime next month. And, you know, just kind of go, hey, listen, hey, as it stands right now, I'm perfectly fine. Although I know sometimes you all may say otherwise, but I'm I feel perfectly fine. But uh, you just have to have those conversations. So thank you, uh, Lizetta, for for sharing those words of wisdom. Now, if you don't mind. I want to switch things up a little bit, okay? All right. So through the years, you and I have had any number of very candid conversations about our children. You know, the ups, the downs, the highs, the lows, as as the song says, joy and pain of raising young Black girls. Now, DEI has been in the news quite a bit lately, and depending on where you're sitting, not in a favorable light. So as you think about the continued growth of your daughter uh, and and, and other girls like her and and sons, we don't want to exclude exclude the boys. It's just that, you know, we got girls. Uh, But as you you think about their growth and those future generations, what comes to mind for you based on what appears to be a shifting DEI landscape today? One of the aspects of wealth and legacy is is storytelling. So we do not forget where we've come from so that we know where we can go. And as a part of that legacy within our family, we have been very specific for cars to know that it wasn't that many generations ago that our ancestors were slavers, slaves. And I've also shared with you about sharecropping, which is another way of capitalizing on human capital, not for the benefit of the person itself. When the George Floyd situation happened along with the pandemic, my daughter was a um, student body leader. So she had to demonstrate a lot of leadership in a predominantly white institution, PWI, independent school. And I said to her that it's not her responsibility to carry the weight for her classmates to give them the opportunity to be aware and take action on what is so visible and so, so real. So if we think about the 2020 situation, here we are in 2024, not that Mm -hmm. far from the rallying cry from America saying we need to do something different because we see how racism shows up in everyday life, human capital, actually human life to now DEI saying there's too many opportunities, reverse discrimination given to marginalized communities. My daughter knows the truth, right? And when you know the truth, you operate out of, out of that truth with courage. She has decided and is, is doing extraordinarily well at a PWI college. That was her preference too. And so her leadership, her being able to navigate a very, very tough climate in her teens have prepared her to be a leader in the future, to be able to vote on matters that are important to her, to speak on matters that are important to her. And that's one of the biggest legacies that we are proud of in giving her is knowing her own worth, which shows up in pay, which shows up in the academy, which shows up in different professions, which shows up X, Y, and Z by just being Black in America. Gotcha, gotcha. So, you know, so as we think through that, you know, are there some things that all of us can do? And, and I mean, all of us. Um, yeah, what are some things that all of us can do to help create a world where everyone can thrive and prosper? Expand your perspective, right? So, Lee, if we're honest, right, most of the conferences that we have attended, we are the minority. Right. That was one of the things that compelled you and your colleagues to create space within the FPA, Financial Planning Association Community, the Diversity Scholarship, which in today's world 
might not even be permissible anymore. And I, fortunately, was one of the recipients of that scholarship, which gave me exposure right, to so much. I mean, people, opportunities, business models, great minds. That's, that's real currency. That's social capital. That's why I said transforming human capital to social capital. Right. And that's what a lot of these opportunities do. So your question to me is, what what can we do? Is continue to intentionally create space and opportunities for people that are different than you. And that includes me, too. I, I have a teammate who does, who is not African-American Black woman. And we are very close um, in our work together. And that was a stretch for me as well, too, because. I, as a small business owner, is thinking about my legacy and wanting to make sure my community is served well, and she's risen to the occasion. There's no different than any other partnership that has difference, whether it's gender, race, um, social economic background, being neurodivergent or not. The key is being open and explore and immerse yourself into different environments. Sometimes I. Um, when I'm giving a presentation, I would say, you know, if you died and you came back, you know, as a black person, how would you feel? Mm-hmm. And a lot of the audiences go just like you just like, whoa. Mm-hmm. And some people haven't even thought about what it means to be in somebody else's shoes. So it's as simple as asking that question and pondering on it. If people would just take a step back and really ask themselves the tough questions and be true with themselves about their responses, then I think we'll see more progress in areas that have been pretty um, operating at a, as a, at a very bad deficit, almost yeah. oppression. <laughs> wow. Wow. That's, that, that's powerful. Um, now, you know, it, it, it's interesting. Something you said earlier reminded me of some reading that I was doing this morning. Like all of us, you open up that inbox and it gets flooded and you're, you're trying to sort through some things. And, and for me, um, you know, uh, when I get it right, You know, there will be some scriptural reading and some industry reading and I can kind of get focused. But one of the things that I came across today was a quote from the incomparable Ella Fitzgerald. Mm. And that quote was, it isn't where you came from. It's where you're going that counts. How does that statement strike you? What does that what does that say to Lizetta? I just said that for me. It is important to know where you came from so you know where you're going to. Mm -hmm. I can't speak to why Ella Fitzgerald, whom I admire, her journey, her courage, her fortitude, her beautiful voice that has transformed the the music industry and of her time and our time as well, too. What I would say for those, and I'm not saying Ella Fitzgerald is one of them. If you do decide to take that viewpoint, it's not where you've been, it's where you're going. I want the where you're going to have the optimism and abundance mindset that sometimes doesn't come into play unless you've done the work to get there. There's something valuable about lessons learned that makes you wiser for the decisions ahead, the actions ahead. Sometimes we want to for, forget because it's just too much, just too hard to remember. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I, I, I believe in courage. I, I believe courage is what is necessary to make a difference because too many people stay comfortable. You know, that, that reminds me of, of something that I said myself uh, some years ago, and I don't remember exactly what the setting was, but encouraging that next generation to get comfortable in uncomfortable situations. You know, when, when I think about the, where I came from, you know, you can look back and so, you know what, maybe I came from sharecroppers that does not dictate or limit the vastness of my future. Uh, so like you, uh, that, that spirit of abundance, uh, that believing in self-worth, um, is something that we cannot allow ourselves to be dictated to or hampered by uh, perhaps uh, our not coming from the, the best places from an economic perspective. Uh, but 
making sure that we are very transparent with uh, our family, uh, our community, and this world uh, about the dynamics of, yeah, this is where I come from. I'm not going to forget it, uh, but I, I believe in abundance, and, and, and here's where we're going. We're all going to go together. So, man, this is... Yes, and I put resilience, you know, as... Whew, I mean, that is a skill set that goes a very long way. So I see what we've been through as a superpower, <laughs> as a strength okay. for the next generation. Now, do we want to repeat that? Absolutely not. No. But if we uh -huh. had to, you know, we can make a whole lot out of nothing. I would like to make a whole lot out of a whole lot. That's right. where I'm going now. <laughs> Let's make a whole lot more. <laughs> right. <laughs> If only mama had that much instead of that much, can you imagine where we would be? Can you imagine? That's why how we're living. So that's how I'm living about the future. Because I, I believe, I know it's possible. We have gotten the tools as financial planners and the exposure to uplift our communities and the greater world as mainstream as well. And so I'm relentless now in the abundance thinking. And Absolutely. so are our clients too. Absolutely. Well, Lizetta, you filled me with an abundance of joy, pleasure. Uh, you shared an abundance of knowledge and, and helpful hints and practical examples of how our audience can have these money conversations and, and transfer knowledge, uh, which is a different kind of wealth uh, to the next generation and, and how we can have those conversations. And so, uh, you know, I hope everyone is encouraged to find a good time and up time to maybe have some of those conversations with their family and their loved ones. Um, now, Lizetta, before we go, uh, if any of our viewers want to reach out to you, if it's speaking engagements, engagements is, uh, you know, to have some of those conversations with or say, hey, listen, I'm ready to speak to a certified financial planner. What's the best way for people to reach out to you? I have made this easy. My website, Lizetta.com. So my first name dot com. If Beyonce and Oprah can do it, why not me? You talk about strong, powerful women. Hey, I'm following their lead and I'm on all the social media platforms at Lizetta Braxton. So reach out. I'd love to hear from you and let's keep this conversation going. Let's keep it going. So again, thank you, Lizetta. We enjoyed having you on today. Uh, for our viewers, don't be hesitant to reach out to Lizetta again on all the platforms. And until next time, level up with Lee.